Welcome to the Royal Statistical Society. Um, if you don't know, already know me, I'm Eleanor Jones. I chair the Teaching Statistics Special Interest Group. It is lovely to see people in person. It'd be nice to have seen more, uh, but we really hope that we're going to be returning to these face-to-face um, -face events if COVID behaves itself from now on. So I'm delighted to introduce Professor Chris Jones, no relation to me, I don't think, <laughs> um, who is giving this year's Teaching Statistics Trust Lecture. So um, Chris is the Associate Dean Education for the Faculty of Health and Medical Sciences at the University of Surrey. He was previously at the University of Auckland in New Zealand, teaching stats to a variety of different types of students. So his research comprises, among many other things, stats and data science education across disciplines, experimental methods in education, technology enhanced learning and teaching, and stats anxiety. So I know we're going to have a lot to learn from your very innovative teaching strategies. So the floor is yours, Chris. Thank you so much, Eleanor. Um, it's always funny when somebody describes you, you think, is that really me? Is that, is that, oh, I do those things, right? Um, so, uh, so just to kind of give you an overview of the, the purpose of this talk and, and, and why it was established. So in 2017, uh, the Teaching Statistics Trust established an annual lecture series for teachers, stats in all subjects, whether specialist or non-specialist. Um, and I sit on the Teaching Stats Trust committee uh, and Neil Sheldon asked me last year, would you like to do it for, um, for this year? And I said, yeah, sure, why not? Um, and the idea is that the actual talk is supposed to encourage new ways of thinking and exciting approaches in teaching statistics, with the ultimate aim that teachers and students gain a deeper understanding of the subject. Um, and it's great for me because that's kind of what I'm supposed to do with this talk. So you can perhaps assess that after I've given the talk. Uh, so in terms of a, a kind of timeline, what I'm going to go through, so I'm going to talk a little bit about myself, me, um, and then that will lead on to and hopefully inform my teaching philosophy and I'll show you kind of how I inform the strategies I use and the pedagogies I use when I teach statistics. And then there's three distinct parts. Now, there are a few points where I've got discussion elements in there for a few minutes, just to, I don't want to talk for a whole hour, um, but do feel free to ask me any questions if you want along the way, um, or you can save them until the end, that, that's absolutely fine. So the three parts I'm going to look at are visualisations and software, and in particular how we use GUIs and different tools to get students to explore and look at data, um, so making things look pretty. Then I'm going to talk about context and challenging data, and I'll show you how I define that um, and strategies that I use to help students to deal with um, challenging data. And then I'm going to finish with telling stories with data um, and some stuff on statistical literacy. So um, as Eleanor said, um, I've been in New Zealand the last four years and um, something that the Maori do is called a papiha, which um, family and tradition is very strong in Maori culture, really, really important element. So the idea is you talk a little bit about your family, your ancestors, where you're from, um, and, it, and, and then people share with you their kind of backgrounds. So I was raised by my grandparents in Wales, um, and I always remember my grandparents had a, a real passion for science and, and curiosity. I mean, they, they themselves, they didn't go to university. I, I was the first one to go to university in my family. Um, and I have to admit, I almost did drop out of my first year. Um, and it wasn't kind of related to, well, I perhaps was going out a bit too much, um, but I remember getting a stern kind of kick at the backside by one of my geology professors saying, look, you need to pull your socks up and start doing stuff. And I'm glad I listened. Um, and that's my mum and uh, me when I had her and um, our dog Alfie. So a very small family. There's, there's not a lot of family members um, left. My grandparents passed away a few years ago. But other adventures that I've done, so uh, I was a support worker for people with learning difficulties, learning disabilities and challenging behaviours for five years. Did that part time as I, as I studied and um, came from a fairly poor background. So I'd never stepped on a plane till I was 21 and I thought I'm going to go big or go home. So I worked in summer camps in the US um, for over two years, 10 months in total. 
um, and I was a nature teacher and taught nature and, and things about data. And I've lived in Scotland, um, New Zealand, the US, and England, and obviously Wales, with a name like Grease Jones. You can't, you can't get away with me being actually Reese. Um, but Welsh. <laughs> so my own academic journey, so, uh, and I think this really helps to communicate how I view statistics and, and how I teach statistics, um, perhaps more as a skill. So a lot of what I'm talking about is more broadly thinking about how we teach embedded statistics for people who are, I suppose you call them non-specialists, but they're not specialising in stats or mathematical statistics. So I started off as a biologist, uh, then I did biomedical science and medical biochemistry, uh, and then I trained as a teacher, and I taught in FE sector for a few years. I got my golden hello, and then I left and went off into um, higher education. And I did a doctorate in education where I created a course, a, a transdisciplinary course in statistics with teachers from different disciplines um, to help them get into university. And this was in social sciences and quantitative methods. So it was a, a really interesting, well, I think it was an interesting course. Uh, and it was uh, approved by uh, access courses in Wales, so it's run now in, in FE colleges. And I've taught on a range of FE and HE courses, mostly HE. And while I was at Auckland for four years, I taught on um, an intro stats paper. And it's quite unusual in the sense that we infill. So everyone in the university does this intro stats course. So about 6,000 students per year do stats, intro stats. So business, psychology, um, economics, biology, all different students. And somehow we managed to get amongst the best satisfaction um, scores. I, when I first got there and I looked, I, I was just amazed. How do you manage to please all these different disciplines doing stats and intro stats course? And it goes up to quite a high level. I have to compare to what I've seen in the UK. They do go up to quite a high level um, in Auckland. And areas that I'm especially interested in from a kind of pedagogy perspective is working with student partners um, and curriculum design, creation and delivery. Uh, really, really things that really pique my, my curiosity. Right, that's enough about me. So, um, moving more into my teaching philosophy now, now, the way I really view education, perhaps one of the reasons and opportunities I have to give this talk is for us to discuss the purpose of education and think about how it changes, particularly in, in relation to society and how society moves on and how technology improves. And uh, what I really want to try and emphasise in terms of statistics and how we teach it is that I view it as uh, areas or parts that we feel we need humans to make decisions for and then other parts we need computers and calculators to, to do. So, and I'll elaborate on that in more detail as I go through. Now in terms of my teaching philosophy and people that I'm really drawn to, uh, Pauli Ferrer uh, and John Dewey, and John Dewey in particular, um, his book on the democracy of edu and education is, is a lot of his ideas and principles are really myself find um, really exciting. And some of these things that I, and it, this links quite nicely to social constructivism and, and some of Vygotsky's work. So thinking about um, learning as being learner centered, education as a process of personal growth and self realization, a um, really strong proponent of active learning and getting students to do things, particularly in large scale lectures. Um, trying to do interactive stuff. Um, holistic learning, uh, curriculum connected to local, social and physical environments, and it being a collaborative experience. And, and if you, I've given this talk a few times, and, and, and it's interesting people say, oh, this is so innovative, or it's new, and it's, it was written in 1916, so it's not, none of these ideas are particularly new. Perhaps there's reasons for certain barriers or, or uh, why it isn't implemented in, in certain places. Now, Back before the pandemic um, hit us, so over in Auckland, I was often teaching classes like this. Hopefully, they will turn up. Um, I have to admit, attendance does seem to wane after a few weeks, um, and then they kind of come back when the exams come. But this is how we viewed, um, how, this is how we taught, right? This is how we worked in universities and hope that all our students came in. And then when the pandemic hit, now, bearing in mind in Auckland, uh, in New Zealand, they completely closed their borders and we were in a lockdown for six weeks. It was a really harsh lockdown. Um, and everything literally flipped online in the space of five days. So we didn't have a lot of time to do this. And my 
first reaction for these students was, uh, was their well-being, to be honest. Um, and I was thinking, they're going to be sitting there, listening to hours and hours of recordings, banging their head against, against the, the table, feeling alone, isolated, um, and really coping, trying to stay asleep, and, and feeling on their own. So that really informed the way I wanted to teach my um, statistics classes. And this meant that we were all really, really, really busy. But an added layer on top of this was trying to teach stats to students and people who, who perhaps didn't even know they were going to do stats. And particularly psychology students, a lot of the time they're not aware how much they have to do in their, in their courses. So you've got that stats anxiety or perhaps wrapped up in maths anxiety on top of that. And what I really want students to see it as is this, like we see it, this amazing world, it explains how we live and, and, and you can apply it in different disciplines in different ways. And one way to do that um, which is the first part of the three elements I'm going to talk about, is to get students to explore data and get them to think about um, how we can visualise and see data rather than just um, getting them to do um, calculations. And I really like this uh, quote from Tuki. And I, as I said in the beginning, I, I trained as a biologist and as I've gone through my career, I've been called all sorts of things. Um, but it, it fascinates me the importance people place on identity and labels and, 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 and they say, oh, you're a statistician, you know what I mean by this, or you're a biologist, you know what I mean by this, and these kind of esoteric groups and their own kind of language. But the thing about st statisticians is we get to play in everyone's backyard. And, um, and Helen McGillivray, who, who works in Australia, an Australian professor in stats, um, it's one of her favorite quotes so, when, when I started to redevelop my, my course online um, during the pandemic, I, as I said, I thought about their well-being, so I wanted to try and make things fun for them. And I think with stats, we have a great, really great opportunity because we can collect all sorts of data from students, with students, for students. And a lot of these tasks um, were not always related to course content. And the idea is that you're doing fun stuff with them and it will make them indirectly, make them engaged with the course. And it also helped to promote that, promote that safe and inclusive learning environment and also shows that I value their contributions when, when I use the data that they give to me. So I just asked them really basic question, what should we do to keep us uplifted and motivated? Um, and also some kind of course content stuff. Tell me the things you don't understand and I'll create a specific video for you. And that's what I did. Now I just, I just set these up with Google Sheets. Nothing, I mean, nothing that fancy or, or groundbreaking. Um, so the way I kind of structured my, my learning page um, on, on our VLA, our virtual learning environment. So I would have, so this is the, these are the weeks. This is the substantive content and kind of the stats and the actual stuff that we're doing, exploring data. And then kind of the fun stuff over here. So where are you from? And it just takes them to an Excel sheet. Um, how can we create an awesome learning environment? What should we call ourselves? We've given them an identity. And it's really, you sometimes wonder, am I opening up a can of worms here when you're getting people to comment on these things? And, and things to keep us uplifted and it, a lot of these things some of them you can kind of obviously not run with other things I did really pick up so um, I, I do think I went a bit overboard and perhaps <laughs> a little bit crazy when I started doing these things but I um, had puppets uh, that role play with each other and did riddles and some of it was linked to course content um, I used things like obviously gap man you probably heard of really good place to um, to give you ideas. We did a cooking session that the students seem to love, a, a live cooking session. And you can see um, other things like uh, looking at things that we don't understand. I think once we've been teaching our content for a while, you as a, as a lecturer, you know the areas, that the pinch points your students are going to come across. But isn't it great when they tell you and then you can organise into themes and then produce a video and it shows that you're listening to them. Right, and, that, and in this was really easy to do. I mean, it didn't take that long. It was a five, 10 minute video looking at some of the, the pinch points. So things like um, the language that we use, right? The students often find difficult. So what do you mean by tools to explore? And in our, the way we use it is what visuals should you use? What types of graphs should you use? So that's what we meant by tools. Um, what is the degrees of freedom? Um, 
what a, what's a t-test statistic? Um, so things that kind of pop up again and again. Now, the thing that we really emphasise in um, on this course is getting students to explore data. So it's very visual, and that's the, the thing that we really start off with. So we get them to keep asking these questions that develop the critical thinking. So what are the main features in the graph? What does it mean? What other details are useful for exploring and understanding the variable? And really important, obviously, for stats, is what assumptions am I making looking at the visuals? Really, really important, particularly when I, when I show you the GUI, um, some of the GUI tools that we use. Now, some of the other activities that I got them to do, just come up with a stream name, what should we call ourselves, where are you from? and pictures of Fano. Now, Fano is a, a Maori word that just means family. So I said, show me pictures of your family. And then we use something called Insight, which runs with R in the background. So R was created in Auckland University. Um, and this is what uh, we use, this Insight tool. So I just want to show you, just when you try some of these things out, um, I mean, I'll show you this one. And what I loved about this activity um, students actually were rearranging and, and, and reordering the data themselves. They were actually commenting on each other, oh, this should go here. And, that, and, that, and I didn't give any guidance to that, and that really fascinated me. I don't know why they wanted to call the stream Rhys Jones's diary. I mean, it was, it was a weird name. <laughs> um, but it, it helped, helped them to kind of form their own identity. And honestly, this type of stuff, um, it might seem uh, perhaps quite Mickey Mouse or, or below university standard, but it's great springboard activity because they're contributing to the data. This is their data that you're using. You can visualize it and show them in the classroom. So obviously you've got the, the variables on the top and then where they're from. Now this particular group, um, I think I had something like 300 students fill it in. So quite a, quite a nice level of engagement. Um, and it's not too onerous for students to fill in, right? It takes them a couple of minutes. And just to show you um, in terms of pictures of fire now, so I, I put a picture up of myself just to start them off, and then, and then they can kind of start putting things up of their pets and, and that sort of thing. So talk, we could talk about different types of data, so things like uh, images, then you can perhaps link in algorithms and, and Google and how they search for tools and that sort of thing, search for images. So that was, that was really nice to see. Now, in terms of uh, software to analyze this, so has anyone used Insight before? I thought you were putting your hand up there, but you're just, <laughs> you're just moving the camera. <laughs> um, so Insight, it's a, it's a free software. There's a web-based version, and also there's a downloadable version, so you can have it as, a, as an application. And the thing I love about using this um, is it, it's just so easy to use, really easy to use, um, and students don't need a lot of skills in terms of coding or anything like that, they, they can just explore data. So if you import your data, and, um, and that's not, hang on, and you, and you just get students to go wherever their data is saved, and this is the one we're looking at where you're from, and once you click that, it will load it up, and you know it's done it right, because a table should appear on the right. And if you go straight to visualize, what's really nice is it, it renders this plot view and it will choose the appropriate plot. So you can really start to tie in a few different ideas here. So you can say, right, let's look at the countries down here. And you can start to talk about things like when you create questions for surveys. Like it's presented New Zealand in different forms here. So some have got capital N, small z, capital N, capital Z. You can really start to get them to think about data and, and how it's presented. Um, and it gives you some nice uh, summary statistics. Um, if you've got um, other types of variables, you can do inferential stuff in here as well. Um, and it will know which ones to use. And you can also do interactive plots, which is quite nice because you can, you can just kind of hover over things and it will give you things like proportions, um, percentages, um, and, and actual values. And it's great because you can get students to just explore this stuff. And I'll have students asking me, oh, can you suggest any data sets I can use to explore this stuff? Or um, can you provide the data sets online? And, and they do, which is nice. OK, so. 
so um, there's a few of the examples that, that we go through. So we look at, um, there's a peer tea test example with kiwi fruit. We do breastfeeding where we look at independent samples. And again, it's, it gives you nice outputs and, and, and it really, it's a lot better than things like SPSS, which um, doesn't integrate it all as nicely as that. Now in New Zealand, um, Insight is used extensively in, in schools. So students come to us having experience of, of doing this and, and manipulating data. And I, it would be really nice if we thought about this in the UK in terms of students coming to us pre-university, having this experience, being able to explore data using software and trying to get that kind of data science fusion with, with statistics. At the moment, I think it's, it's too disparate and, and they're, too, they're too far apart. And they really need this flying time. Somebody called John McGuinness, you might have heard of, talks about um, in the social sciences. Students need time to be able to experiment and, and explore data and get that, get that fun, fun and attitude towards it. And in using these examples, what we often find, I know I've just cherry picked one example, but this, this type of feedback is what we get. Um, and they, and they, they really flip their attitude and they, they love it. They love this approach to teaching stats. Um, and they look forward to coming again um, when, when they come. Now, in terms of kind of tying the loop in and, and presenting these large scale interactives and activities we do with, with big um, lectures and, and big cohorts, um, I wrote a case study and it was, we got some small grants. So these are two of my former colleagues in Auckland, Emma Lurk and Anna Ferguson and Anna is, just an amazing, amazing person, amazing colleague, um, so creative. And she's just finishing a doctorate in data science at the moment and how we teach stats. Um, really, a really, really good uh, colleague to, well, I, I miss. And so in terms of a case study, so I'll just show you briefly how we kind of close the loop on this. So this was, um, a technology enhanced learning type case study in Auckland Uni. And it, it goes through kind of the background, how I developed things. I mean, you can see it's not everyone's style of teaching. I mean, I'm, I'm quite informal and I'll have things like that in the background and, and wear my cap. I see New Zealand's much more chill than the UK, I think, in general. So um, they don't mind so much, the students. Um, and we did a cooking session. And what's really nice is when you Students actually created TikTok of my sessions, which really was a bit concerning. I mean, <laughs> I had one student say this, she sits down with her family eating popcorn. I was like, what? <laughs> really, really um, bizarre. But when you see some of the feedback, and, and I suppose we'd, we'd like to think that we're making an impact on our students and, and they're enjoying their learning. And this one really kind of touched me and they said they, they had a bit of a cry that made them feel human again. Um, through some of the things that we were doing. So that, that was really, really nice to see. Okay. Now, one other thing I, I would just like to draw attention to, and you can see I think a lot of the activities we did in New Zealand were really to try and evidence or create uh, case studies and, and examples to give to other people to use. And this was one thing that um, Anna Ferguson set up and, and, we, and we worked together as a team, me, Emma and Anna. So we created a series of blogs with ideas and snippets to do things like create a co-identity. Um, some of them are more specific to teaching statistics, um, but you, you'll see here, um, we've got some stuff and then this was, the, oh, sorry. So we've got some stuff here on um, using Google, um, looking at context, why bother choosing interesting context for teaching stats, why not just flip coins or look at dice, um, using chocolates and lectures. So that's a really nice uh, blog. It finished in November 2020, but there, there might be some interesting stuff there for you to look at if you want to. Okay, so just reflections on some of those things that, that, that we did there. Um, they do take time, they love, students love those kind of fluffy activities um, and it gets them to uh, engage with the activities that you're doing when you're teaching stats um, and, and some of the more substantive content. Um, but as I said, students might see you differently and it's not everyone's style. Okay, uh, are there any questions from that first part? No? Okay. 
Because obviously I'm, I'm a lot older than, than, than you, I mean, and I'm, I'm not a statistician, though I have developed some things. Um, I, I, I was used in my working life and, in, and as a student to the question of visualizing and how you show data better and all the rest of it. And uh, fine, that's how most learning works. You know, you've got words or you've got pictures. Um, only about 10 years ago, I became aware that not everybody thought the same way that I did, in the sense that I don't see pictures in my mind. I cannot, I cannot keep any pictures in my mind. I don't dream in pictures. I, I dream in concepts and sound. Um, how do you, is there a way of getting through to students, new students, about uh, using other, other methods apart from the purely visual that might stick in themselves in the memory of those of people like me? Yeah, so just, just to flip a question back, so do you prefer looking at tables or like how, how do you... No, I don't know. I'm, I'm genuinely asking just not sure. question. Yeah. Are there ways of getting it in? Because the, 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 obviously my method is you've got to convert it into, into a set of concepts first and then you can remember the concepts rather than remembering a, a, remembering a particular image. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe one step more than is necessary, but there we are. Yeah, no, it's a good question. I suppose that... If you think about it in terms of the whole kind of course and how we teach it, we, we front load and start to talk about, here's data, we'll, start, we'll, we'll talk about rectangular data sets, and then we start explaining the data, and then we'll say, look, this is how it looks like in a graph, and, and we sell it as a way you need to be able to read graphs and interpret them. To, it's quicker to spot differences or spot patterns. So that's the way we kind of say, this is important skills for you to develop. And as we move through, there's, there's a change in focus. So we're not always showing them graphs and visuals. So we, for example, might be looking at how to calculate a confidence interval or how to interpret a test statistic. And, but it, it, is, it is quite essential for, I think, for teaching statistics, um, particularly looking at um, p-values and, and, and where data falls. I mean, if you're looking at regression, for example, or linear regression, you, you need to do it. So I think we try and say these are important skills and you have to do these things. And, and um, it's, it's, not a, it's not a point I've come across before, but it's an interesting one. I've not really thought about that before, but it's an interesting one. I'm not sure how, I mean, most students uh, sit there and they, they seem to enjoy it and they, and they like the visual elements of it because it's quite engaging and you kind of put p p uh, different colours on and that sort of thing and they, they seem to enjoy it. But no, it's an interesting... The, the, the A fantasy of psychological condition is quite rare. I'm not pretending it's common. Yeah. Place. Yeah. And no, that's an interesting question. Yeah. 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 Um, Okay, the next part that I'm going to go on to is um, called challenging data sets and context. Um, and it's kind of linking back to this uh, quote, the best thing about being a statistician is that you get to play in everyone's backyard, but what does backyards look like? And I suppose what I'm alluding to here is, um, when you're looking at teaching statistics and drawing on different disciplines, and you particularly look at pre-university and, and our expectations on teachers are teaching stats, a lot of stats teachers, the maths, and they like the beauty and the art of maths and kind of and, and writing formula and equations. But statistics and thinking statistically is quite different. It is quite different. So what do people have confidence in using and drawing on different disciplines? And particularly if students start to ask questions that might not necessarily be statistical, what, how do we deal with that? And why bother using different examples and, and making it interesting? So, I suppose my response to that would be that we know the world is full of data and it can often include controversial or sensitive topics. So should, should I use or draw on sensitive topics or should I just, I don't know, talk about roller coasters or, or things that are perhaps neutral that the students, you might not um, offend anyone. So data can come in many different forms, as we know, and it can be used in a variety of contexts. The same data can be used to explore many different contexts. And context and subject matter can give a data a new lease of life. I suppose what I'm saying here is what makes statistics different to maths is there's usually some explanation behind the numbers. There's, 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 there's something that it's talking about. Um, and we're not just kind of working with numbers for, for the beauty of, of perhaps doing a, a method. And different contexts and subjects can mean different things to different people, both on an individual level and to different cross-sections of society. And 
The way I define challenging data is any data set that is assigned to a controversial or poten potentially sensitive topic that can be emotionally triggering, triggering upsetting or cause distress. Um, I've had some um, feedback from people saying perhaps you should call it sensitive data. I mean, you could, you could really play around with the name of it. But this is, this is what I mean by challenging. Not that it's difficult to actually do the analysis or anything, but it, it could be emotionally triggering. So, could you ask you to perhaps have a little chat for a few minutes um, to think about um, why should we deal, teach sensitive or perhaps emotionally triggering examples of, of data sets in our teaching? Have a little chat, have a think, um, either on your own or with people, and then we'll... Um, if you want to use... I've got a Padlet set up, so if you want to post your ideas on the Padlet, that's fine. There's not many people here, so we can perhaps just share them. So I'll, I'll give you a few minutes to have a think. OK, then, everyone. Um, let's, let's bring it back together then. So does anyone want to volunteer? Why, why should we even bother using different examples? Why should we spend time perhaps selecting sensitive or emotionally triggering topics? Yeah? I, I, I would, uh, sort of based on my experience in, in, in teaching the similar sort of introduction to stats at master's degree level in a very multicultural environment, I would stay away from them because uh, it feels like it distracts from the concepts you're trying to teach. Uh, and that perhaps is a top topic that can be picked up later on, sort of when they're confident in stats, um, if it's an area that they want to dwell in, for example, for their dissertation. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a really valid point. Um, anyone else? I think it might encourage students to get involved with something, spark a bit of a debate, perhaps, and that might encourage them to actually think about the stats and how they might solve problems. But uh, yeah, it's something that I've steered it clear of, or tried to steer clear of um, in, in the past. Okay, yeah, yeah. How about you over here? Oh, oh, oh. Like yeah. the look at the politics of data analysis, like if you have a sensitive topic and politically you're coming at it from this angle, how do you interpret a set of data relative to if you're coming at it from a different political angle? Uh, but I was also saying to Eleanor where I work, they are very hypersensitive about this sort of thing. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. I work on a psych degree, so there's high rates of uh, mental health issues and students and stuff. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Very cautious. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's useful. Um, are you, anyone here? Did you want to volunteer and answer? Um, opinions of particular values. I'm not a teacher or a, or a statistician, but, uh, but with my political hat on, I personally think we've got to get as much information about everything out there as possible. And if that changes my mind or your mind or anybody's mind, then great. Yeah. And, 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 and uh, information that comes out, results that come out, to, to, uh, conflict with somebody's deeply held beliefs, then they have to look at them. They have to look at that data, yeah. and, and both challenge the data and say, how, how might that be biased, and, and look at themselves as well. Yeah, yeah. No, really valid points. Um, and, and yeah, it's definitely something that I think obviously we'll wrestle with, or we've all thought about perhaps at some level, um, that I, I I mean, part of it does come into um, how you manage, perhaps, conflict or manage if people have, as you said, different beliefs or different ideas, and um, how do you deal with that, right? I mean, I, I remember I, um, the first few weeks of teaching in Auckland, it was perhaps the second iteration of teaching the, the paper, and, and we look at HIV rates and, um, and homelessness in San Francisco. And when uh, a psychology student came up at the end, and um, he, kind of, a, I don't want to say verbally attacked, but it was very forceful. And he said to me, I, I really don't like, to the point, I don't like your use of the word um, acquired in AIDS, because it suggests blame on the individual. And they were picking up on every single word. I, and it obviously was hugely emotionally triggering for that person. Um, and, I, and I said to them, send it all in email to me, and, I'll, and then I'll respond in a diplomatic way. Um, I know if it was some of my other colleagues, they would have been a bit more uh, aggressive in their response, but I, was quite, I like to think I'm quite a Zen person, so I was quite chill, and I took a step back, and I said, well, obviously this upset you. Let me know why it's affected you, and I'll, and I'll respond. And I suppose my response was, um, as an educator, I feel it's my duty to tell you and teach you about the world, um, and obviously try and do it in a safe environment, but 
I can't use, I mean, you suggested using data sets on uh, roller coasters or Olympics or, or neutral, but again, that's quite subjective and it depends on the individual. So it's, it's a difficult one, but uh, my response was I, I need to teach about these things. And, and kind of based on what you were saying, um, this is part of being human, right? And communicating data and using data to inform opinions and beliefs. So my response was no. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about um, roller coasters and, and, and football results and that sort of thing. So kind of based on this discussion, I, um, I kind of came up with a framework or, or uh, perhaps uh, pointers to help um, people, students as individuals to read through these things and, and think about whether they want to um, can look at the data or perhaps skip it. And some of this comes from, um, I'm writing a book at the moment on statistical literacy. So, um, and actually one of the editors, when I, I submitted some chapters, they said, oh, I don't like you using this example. It, it could be triggering. So we, we thought, well, let's come up with a framework to help build in critical thinking, but help people assess why it's making them feel like that. And really try and get down to the root of it. So just as kind of some prompts, and this is for teachers as well, or people teaching this stuff, or perhaps anyone. Um, why, what is the topic being assigned to? Is it to do with gender diversity, religion, politics, health? Um, how does it make you feel? Is this something personal, being something personal to you? And I think as you picking up, Andy, you're saying about bias and, and, and who perhaps created this data, or there's always an agenda behind why data has been created, right? And what gets what gets chosen to be included and not included when you generate data. There's always somebody behind it that has an agenda. So think about why the data has been created in the first place, um, and and why do you think it? What is it telling us about the world? Is it interesting? What issues is it tackling or getting you to think about? Um, and when you look at the data. Uh, think about why it was collected, how is it being used, perhaps it's part of a report or a story, um, how is it being used, what's the agenda of the author, and something that I, I find especially interesting more recently, and we were talking about this earlier, most data in the Western world is, is created by or for um, white male, white males, white men, and it's interesting when you start to look at things like queer data, data based on females, ethnic minorities, it gives her a very different flavour. And, and I mean, of course it does, right? Uh, I mean, you look at the metrics that are used to uh, make mobile phones, they're based on male parameters. So women are kind of struggling using mobile phones. So it, it's important questions to, to ask and think about because it really has a huge impact on the way we live and the way we think. So I think it's really important that we talk about these things. Okay, um, so the next part I'm going to look at um, is uh, looking at context um, and whether it's, whether it's king or queen and how important is context when we teach using statistics. Um, so we know context matters and um, again, I'm going back to this quote, the best thing about being a statistician is you get to play in everybody's backyards. And I think sometimes... Um, I worked in social sciences for about four years in a social sciences department. And, uh, and the, when I supervise students in that, particularly criminology students and, and all different types of students, the thing that really struck me coming from a science background is how scientists really don't think about these things. Um, when you go into the social sciences and, and, and even psychology, it, it's, it's important. And, I, and it's a shame our scientists don't think about these things in, in, in more detail. So you think about um, what is data? How is it created? Do you trust it? So we, we, I mean, statisticians might look at validity, um, internal and external validity, um, but thinking about the legit le legitimacy of knowledge and what about the ways in which we collect and generate uh, data and knowledge. And some of the things I'm talking about here are things on ontology and epistemology. Now, often, um, again, even when you get to PhD, I'd, I'd say the hard sciences, the, the students don't even think about these things. They're doing the scientific method. That's it. That's the, the best method on the planet, right, for what they're doing. Whereas they are, there are important things to think about here. And I, and I do mention this when I teach stats, interest stats to, to students when I did it in Auckland. So thinking about um, ontology, and it, it just helps to get their creative juices flowing. And, and they might never have been asked these things um, about questions about reality and, and epistemology and thinking about how do we know what we know. Um, and I think they are really important questions. And it links to, um, I suppose, 
questions on choosing context and what do you actually choose when you're teaching stats? Why even bother taking the time to choose different, why don't we just get them flipping coins or, or looking at dice or picking out um, cards? Um, why, why don't we choose different things? So we know the world's full of interesting stuff, which is brilliant. Um, we, we haven't really got time to chat, because uh, I'm guessing people will have to shoot off at four. Um, but I will just skip on. So um, as I said, why bother finding time? What, what's interesting? What are the advantages of taking these approaches? And in particular, as we talked about, what are the concerns around choosing perhaps challenging data sets or, or sets that could be emotionally triggering? And of course, so part of this is going to be subjective. So what I find interesting, and, I, and I've noticed this, I remember when I was um, an undergrad and our lecturers would often say, oh, did you see this on the news? And I don't watch the news. What? And you get older, oh, I watch the news now. <laughs> so it's, it's one of those things you think, am I choosing these things that I think my students will find interesting or things that I find interesting? Or how do you cho choose that? So we know that it's really important uh, context, and particularly if you're teaching students who are not, not chosen stats as their discipline, right? They're doing psychology because they hopefully find psychology interesting or biology or whatever they're doing. And as I said, what context do you choose? Do you choose interdisciplinary contexts? And again, that adds an extra layer of complexity when, when, you choose, when you're drawing on different disciplines. Um, and how much confidence do you have in being able to use the mathematical and statistical terms? And, and I think something that we sometimes rely, we leave the students to rely on, we leave the students to do these things themselves too much, is to make those conceptual leaps. So they're learning a skill, a statistical skill, say in a certain subject or topic, and then we expect them to just seamlessly transfer that to a different topic or different area. And, and, I, and I, I feel that there's more help needs to be given to students in being able to weave that, that, that skills with the knowledge into different disciplinary areas. And when you start to do that, what does it do to the identity of statistics? Now, if you think about the examples and the way I've taught it previously, I think one of the reasons why they, they seem to enjoy it so much is because they don't see it as being mathematical or, or even statistical in some ways. And, and, and that kind of gets rid of all that kind of baggage from that anxiety that they might have picked up. And they can see, really see the value in it. I mean, I'm sure if, if you went back to your students and asked them a few years down the track, um, was it valuable, the stats I taught you? They say, yes, it is, because they've, they've seen how it's applied in their fields and in their areas. So, as I, as I said before, I use a lot of active learning approaches, and it's a really great way to engage and motivate, and I'm, and I'm sure some of you use these approaches as well. Um, in thinking about familiar or unfamiliar topics, um, sometimes I use, I suppose, topics that are things that I know that they can feel safe to contribute to. So usually there's not a kind of right or wrong answer. So one, one example that I use with them is saying, um, we all say thank you, and then I'll show them a little video, perhaps a YouTube video, looking at the reasons behind why people say thank you. And then I might ask them to um, come up with a, start to generate some quantitative data, some actual data that we can analyze. So on a scale of one to 10, how often do you rate yourself in terms of giving praise? Do you do it that we know some people give it all the time, other people don't? Um, who are you more likely to give praise to? What makes a thank you genuine? So we're starting to really get them to think about how do you define parameters or the things that you're measuring? And I think that's something that is so important to students, particularly when they're doing research in their, in their own areas. What are, you, what are you actually looking for which can help them decide what they're excluding and including in their, in their data? Um, I, I mean, I would say, uh, another place that's a, a never-ending source of, of really good examples for things like this is This Morning, the TV show This Morning. It's brilliant because they, they, they often take perhaps quite serious topics and they're just a bit silly with it. I mean, it's, it, it's great. So, for example, um, should you sunbed naked in your own garden? And they actually had pro and con person debating this. And it's great because you, if you ask students this, um, I mean, obviously, you've got to try and kind of test the waters and see if they, you don't want to offend people, right? Um, but everyone will probably have an opinion on this, and it's safe. There's not, not going to be a right and wrong answer, right? Um, one, one topic that I've used with students a lot, um, and it makes me laugh every time I do it, is, is it okay to call people love or darling? And it's a debate with um, Kim Woodburn and, and this other person. And it's only about five minutes long, but it's great because the 
you can really get students to think about things like how are they using data? What makes that argument convincing? And it's, it's really important skills, as you were kind of talking about earlier, uh, looking at beliefs and, and why people form beliefs and, and ideas and, 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 and critical arguments. What makes a, an argument convincing? And I just get them to come up with an experiment or observational study to measure that parameter, think about how they're defining that parameter, and then think about generating research questions and how they are actually going to explore that area. I mean, it was great in New Zealand because no one knew who Kim Woodbin was. So I'm not sure if that was a good or bad thing, but um, they, they seem to enjoy it. Um, so the, it's something called the PB-DAC cycle. Um, actually, not in hands, which is great. So this was um, developed by one of my former colleagues in Auckland, Maxine Van Kuch and Chris Wilde. And it's interesting, when I first saw this, I just thought this is the scientific method. Um, but it's kind of been slightly more, so it's planning, preparation, um, disc um, analysis, conclusion, and data, the D is data, collecting the data. So it's kind of very similar to scientific method you might learn in school, like planning, preparing, methods, that sort of thing. And things, activities like this really get students to help think about this cycle and, and, and think about what they're exploring. And, and in some ways, it, I think it helps them to make that um, relational understanding between the topic and the, the process of, of getting data. OK, uh, the last part of my talk now, um, and this, this is the shortest part, so it's not, it's not much longer. Um, it's telling stories with data and statistical literacy. So how a, a huge challenge I've seen in students is, is trying to get them to pull all these different strands together. Um, and, and they've perhaps got outputs, they've got uh, results from a statistical test, or they might uh, be communicating a confidence interval. Um, they really find it difficult to put that into a, into a narrative, in, in my experience. So statistical literacy is, is the ability to understand and reason with statistics and with data. And, and I suppose why, why should we tell stories, uh, data with stories? So we know it involves an incorporation of a narrative, where it can include an account uh, of a series of events or facts in an order that enables the reader to make connections between them. And data on its own, as I said before, can be just a collection of numbers, um, which requires an explanation. And I think this is where the stats comes in, right? This is why we, we need statistics and what, and what it is. It enables the author to draw the reader's attention to a particular section or data being presented. And we see this all the time. We see it in politics. We see it on TV, uh, in the media. People are, are trying to kind of peddle a story, and they're using data to try and convince you of their side. Um, and using, using visuals can help tell that story and help tell that data because visual data, when we look in graphs and, and, and outputs like that, um, it really helps you to um, get the handle of what the person is trying to say. So um, pulling, pulling all these things together, um, just the last thing, and, I, and I, it's a bit of a shameless plug, sorry. So I, I wrote a book a few years ago, um, and it's not... And this is a, a more of a student workbook, and it's, we're talking about all these different skills and the ability to pull, uh, create a career narrative, to pull uh, graphs in and visuals, but we also obviously have to recognise that there is some element of essential math skills that students need to be able to do, and it's surprising how many come, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you agree, how many come to us, they can't round or they can't do really proportional reasoning. Um, and this book links to real examples and, and real-world um, data sets and helps to build that curiosity and get them to explore data. And, and, it, and it, it just stops at inferential, um, which, is where, which is where a lot of them start to panic. Um, so, um, so building on these essential skills, it, I, mean, I mean, this book helps introduce them to descriptive statistics and describing what variables are. And I, I mean, even... Even this, getting students to think about what variables that they're using, is, it can be a challenge, because they'll look at the numbers and think, what is this? Well, what do I do with this? And it's just some of these skills I think we perhaps gloss over and jump to some of the more complex um, ideas. So, um, so I suppose that, that's just kind of a, a reiteration of, of, of of what I've said through kind of telling a story and using descriptive data to help create that narrative. Um, and that's the end of my story. Now, just before I finish, 
um, I would just like to say that um, I, I'm setting up, um, I've been asked to revive the old centre in Plymouth, the RSS Centre for Statistical Education, and, um, and it's going to hopefully revive the Census at Schools programme. Um, it's hopefully going to do, I've probably overpromised on all these things, um, but really keen and excited to um, build into areas that you're working on and really value and input and feedback in, in, and see if we can collaborate in some way, um, particularly the RSS. So um, that's me and that's just something to finish with from me. So thanks for listening, questions if you have any. Thank you very much, Rhys. Lots to think about there. So, we're a tour group, so please do feel free to tip in with comments or questions. Andy? Um, I think in, in my teaching career, I often learn a lot more from what goes wrong than what goes right. So, do you have any examples of things that have gone wrong that you've learned something valuable from? <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, I suppose just um, drawing on my example earlier when I talked about that student that came to me and was very upset with the, the examples that we were using, I suppose what that really hit home to me was how careful I had to be with the language I use and in particular drawing on if I'm using challenging data in particular. I mean, I didn't myself think that that was particularly challenging, um, but obviously that person did. So I suppose it made me realise, don't be so flippant with some examples and, and just try and treat all, all the areas I'm teaching. I mean, I think that was quite an extreme case. That person was literally picking up on every word I was saying and had problems with the, even the word AIDS, which is a medical term that's used. Um, so that, I suppose that's something that really made me refocus and, and think about the way I, I communicate. Yeah, which is a big thing for stats, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I think if you're, if you're a student on one of your courses, it sounds very exciting being a student. The problem I have, or one of the problems I have, is that as term goes on, students get more and more anxious about the assessment that's going to come at the end. And actually, however exciting you make it, or however interesting you make it, the, the constant question is, is it in the exam, or is it in the coursework I'm taking away, all that sort of stuff. So I'm interested to see how you integrate or respond to those sorts of issues that students Yes. Because they're obsessed with the degree they're going to get at the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a really good question. And I, in a New Zealand context, an Auckland context, I mean, New Zealand tertiary education is more similar to the US model. So they um, have to do this stats paper as a core. They can't pass their degree unless they pass this paper. So it acts as a barrier to some of them. Um, I, I'm being recorded. I would say New Zealand over-assess, I say Auckland over assess the students, so for example in that paper that I talked about, they would have to do six quizzes with 2% each, three written assignments, a midterm test, this is stage, this is year one, a midterm test and an exam. And we, we usually, there's a lot of support, a huge amount of support, but there's usually pass rate of 85%. Now if you think about numbers that fail, it's 1,500, no, no, I've probably done that wrong, but there's a lot, I've definitely done that wrong, there's a lot that fail, right? Um, oh, I shouldn't be saying these things, <laughs> but in, in New Zealand, in Auckland, um, when you, if you fail a paper, you have to redo the whole thing, so the student gets charged per paper, so they have to pay for the paper again, so it's not a huge problem, sounds awful, doesn't it? But it's not a huge problem, it's a good enough pass rate but yeah, there's a challenge with that. So, but as the, as the term goes on, are they getting more and more anxious about this and, and you hearing that question? Are they still just... Do you know, in, in some ways, in some ways, no. Because there's so much assessment, they're getting feedback and they know that they're banking certain amounts. And we have this calculator where they, it, where they can put in the amount of whatever they've done so far and it, and it gives them different weightings and they can see if they're heading for a certain grade. So we know from experience. So in some ways, because it's so over-assessed, it's actually, it seems to alleviate the anxiety. 
um, because they, it gives them a kind of trajectory. Whereas if you look at, say, the UK, we tend to have fewer assessments, but they're meatier and they're bigger. So say they do something in the middle and they don't do so well, I think they get quite anxious then because, it's, say, I don't know, it's 50%, 60% for the exam. There's quite a lot of pressure to put on. So I'd, I'd say in some ways, no, and then we provide all the model answers, so if they do a written assignment, they get all the responses to that, and, they, and then it helps feed forward. So in some ways, no, but obviously you are going to get stressed out students. I mean, we, we give them loads of past exams. Um, interestingly, the, the way that the exams and midterm tests are written there, they're all based on real data, real journal articles, and, we cre and it's all MCQs, um, but they're often you can see similarities with previous papers. So they'll get an idea and the types of things we're going to ask them, but you can't look on Chegg or they can't cheat because the context is different. I mean, they've tried, um, but we've, we've come up with ways on our, uh, well, I'm saying we, when I worked there, um, on Blackboard, there's different ways that we try to come around doing that. Um, no, it's, a, it's a good question though. Yeah, and they still get quite anxious. I mean, at, at the end, the very last topic we teach is um, simple linear regression. And that, that really fascinates me because all the way through it, I think there's a kind of an emphasis on all oh, shades of grey with measuring uncertainty and, um, and students really want the right wrong answer. And when we get to sim simple linear regression, that's the part where it is, it's probably the most mathematical. So, so some of them really love it. They really, you can see they really switch on, whereas I think most of them are kind of like, oh, a bit tired and they just want it to end. Sort of, as, I guess, as a follow-up to your last comment, um, just thinking about the range of students, particularly in New Zealand, who took the same module, do you find that certain types of students, I guess going back to the question this gentleman was asking earlier, you know, that, that sort of, the way that module was presented would have been very frustrating to me at university, but I guess that the bulk of students would find it very interesting. Do you, do you sort of cater for the fact that you have different types of students possibly doing different subjects, and therefore learn in different ways? Yeah, I... And I think this links back to the way that tertiary system is set up in New Zealand, like the US and, and pre-university. In the UK, we get our young people to specialise very early on, I think, in GCSE, they, and then they're thinking about what you can do for A-level, and, and it re we really kind of narrow the, what, what they're going to look, look at and go into. Whereas in New Zealand, there's much more, much more choice, much more variety. I mean, you could do um, all sorts of combinations. You can do conjoint, you can do four years. Um, you, could, you could, say, do a degree in stats and have more papers in psychology and it'll still be called stats. And it is, so they have that mentality, I think, that they're going to do a broader range of subjects. So that I think they're more receptive to doing something like this, the statistics, intro to stats, drawn in different disciplines because they can see that we're trying to appease them. So we'll use examples from business, from psychology, from, from biomedical science and try and contextualise it. So they, they're usually quite happy. Um, I, I, interestingly, there's, when we look at feedback in, in the module evaluations, it's not often we'll see things like, I wish we were doing more business examples. Um, we, we don't see that that often. Which surprises me, because you'd expect, I think if we taught it in the UK, you, you probably would get more comments like that because of the way our education system is set up here and it, and it gets students to specialise at a younger age. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? Yeah, can I just ask a sort of follow on to that question, really? So um, I teach a module at the Open University, which also has 12 million different qualifications. <laughs> that's not that much of an exaggeration, actually, that people study in there as well. And um, we do a similar thing in terms of using a whole range of examples, but really using the stories for those people to go through as well, to a certain extent. But um, kind of only really in the last year where I've started to split these students into more qualification type of groups and transport them in slightly different ways. My question to you is, you kind of glossed over stats anxiety a little bit down there. Um, I'm more and more starting to think that there are different types of stats anxiety depending what discipline area you yeah. come from, even when you're studying the same material. So I'm wondering in terms of the feedback that you get from your broad lot of students, whether it's possible to identify that and maybe deal with that within your module in some way. And if so, and you've got a kind of magic bullet for that, 
<laughs> so can you just can you just <laughs> can you just elaborate on the question again? So, so the question is that when you're teaching something like you are, when yeah. you're teaching a whole group of students at the same time, yeah, yeah, yeah. and obviously there are different qualifications, there are different things that pe students find difficult depending what their background is, yep. particularly in terms of statistics. So if they come from a more scientific background, the maths bit of it may be absolutely fine. But dealing with words mm. and uncertainty, they're never going to be able to get. Yeah. Whereas the economic students, well, my economic students really can't cope with the maths at all. Yeah. There, but they're kind of quite happy to waffle ad nauseum about yeah. things like that. So I think they've got a sort of different, different sorts of anxiety yeah. about statistics depending where they come from. Yeah, okay, yeah. So I suppose. Um, the way the course is structured in New Zealand, it's there's hardly there's not a lot of mathematics they have to do. So the most they do is kind of add, subtract, take away, and yeah. uh, reading outputs and seeing how you put that into a narrative. Um, at different points, I mean, right at the beginning, it always interests me. We get a lot of international students, and we've got a lot of international students there. Obviously, English isn't their first language, so they're really struggling initially because we, we're telling them, we're saying, look, this is a strong emphasis on literacy and, and communicating data. Um, and they, they can do all the number stuff, yeah. but it amazes me how how they're able to really, and a lot of it I think is scaffolding and we emphasize um, different language to use. So we use was like fairly safe bet and, and really emphasize on the language elements and literacy. So that really seems to help the majority of them. Um, I mean, in terms of, as we go through the course, I suppose kind of links back to your point, because there's a lot of assessments as well. Um, students, I feel they, as long as they're keeping up, They'll, they'll get feedback and be able to feed that forward and, and, and progress through the, the paper. Um, I mean, you see some students repeating it three or four times, and we've got things like tutorials and a dedicated team and, and office hours and those sorts of things, and we try and be open and say, come and talk to us if you need help. Um, if they get to the point where they fail beyond their third time, um, I think they, they won't pass their degree, third or fourth time. So there's not a huge amount of them. Um, I suppose that in terms of the anxiety, like I said, that one of the reasons why I use some of the activities and try and make it fun, and, 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 and that helps, I think, and that helps make it a bit more accessible for them, or, or at least gives them the idea they want to engage and, and actually get in with the content. Um, and, with, and with this quite explicitly saying this isn't mathematics, it's different. It's not mathematical. I think, I think we even say, if you love doing calculations and, and working with numbers, this isn't the course for you. But it's compulsory, so they have to do it anyway. <laughs> but that, I think using that language really helps alleviate some of that anxiety as well. I mean, I, in New Zealand, the stats and maths are completely separate curriculum areas, yeah. um, which helps. And I, I'd love that to happen here in the UK. It'd really be nice if we could, because I see stats as, as akin to engineering and physics in relation to how they draw in mathematics and the, the skills you need to that. So I see it as separate, and I think it should be separate. Um, the way you see it at the moment, A-level, it's, it's, it's too mathematical. And for what we're talking about here, the majority of our students need, it shouldn't, it's not correct in its current form, I don't think. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> as to how things work in New Zealand. Uh, so you said that uh, students are using insights from a very young age? From um, probably 13, 14. Okay. Yeah. And so four years of, of using it before, if they, before they come to us at 18. Because one of the biggest problems I've seen in, in the UK is that our sort of UK students, I don't know what everybody else has seen, um, stats is a bad rep and it's really difficult to get students, certainly difficult to get students onto stats degrees and when they realise you know, go to university, I'm not, you know, I'm going to do biology or whatever, oh my goodness I have to do stats and I hate stats and they have this attitude embedded mm. and it's really difficult to, to turn this round. Yeah. So, you know, could you say a little bit more about how different that is in New Zealand and is yeah. it because that they see this 
uh, sort of stats not done in a mathematical way from an early age. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's exactly the way it's viewed there. I think it's because it, it's separate from mathematics and the way it's taught. Um, it, a lot of the curriculum is created by researchers at Auckland who are stats education researchers. So we've generated an evidence base and shows these methods work. So using things like the PB that cycle, the scientific method, um, getting to think about investigating and, and research questions and then generating data. So they see it as something separate and then they use things like insight and they use the tools to visualize data. So by the time they get to us, um, probably answers part of your question as well. Um, they perhaps not as anxious as they might be here, where they don't have they don't have that comparable type of training. I mean, I love GCSE statistics. I think that I don't know if you've seen the specs for that. It's really good, and then it kind of goes a bit pear shaped when it gets to A level stats because it's. It, and it, we, obviously we need people in society that can do that type of stats and A-level stats. We need people who can do the probabilistic and Bayesian and all that kind of mathematical stuff. But for the majority of people, they, they probably don't need that. They need more of the stuff that we're talking about here, which, is, which should be mirrored in schools, I think, and in, in the curriculum. But it's, yeah. I mean, I know I'm very biased. I'd love to see a university system where everybody going to university has to do at least some... Stats of course, stats, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, the way, the way we sold it in Auckland and the way they sold it in Auckland Uni is they said to all the departments, like uh, business economics, psychology, if you let us teach your stats, we'll do a good job, we promise. That'll free up your academics to do research. You don't have to do this in your own areas. So that, that really seemed to work. And the, there were some worries that they were going to take it back and start teaching it in a perhaps more uh, contextual form by their own academics. but. As I said, the, the rating of the evaluation was always really high, um, and we could see we're doing a good job, and we looked to make sure it was mapped into the, their programs. So that's the way we, we, they did it there, is to say, look, your academics can do research. You don't have to do this. We'll do it for you. And, and, it, and it seemed to work. Okay. Yeah. So any, any other questions? Yes. Um, I'm an editor at um, Cambridge University Press. Um, I was just wondering, like, how can textbook publishers or book publishers support students and lecturers on these modules? Um, so, that's an interesting question, and I, I suppose... So you've I, already obviously got some books. Yeah. In your and the, days, that's a really good, interesting yeah. question. I, um, so the, the, uh, I, the first student workbook is this SAGE, and it came off the back of, of doing some work for uh, Andy Fields' textbook. So I actually... Um, did some of the mass diagnostic questions for that and, and when we had chats with the editors they said there's not a lot of textbooks or support for, for students kind of who, who are struggling with some of these essential, we, we call them basic skills but we call them essential so it's not as um, the labelling effect and I think a lot of stats books they sometimes jump too high up and, and I think universities in, in particular, but political, they're not willing to accept that their students, if they have that gap in two years of not doing maths, they think that you, if you don't use it, you lose it, they come to you and they, and they can't do some of these skills that we're talking about in the book. And that's, I think, one of the reasons why um, the, perhaps you're starting to see a few more, but that's probably a barrier why they're not there at the moment. Um, it's because you expect, if a student comes to you with GCSE maths, they should be able to do um, like rounding and percentages and convert with ratios and proportional reasoning, but we know a lot of them struggle. So I'm, and I'm glad you say no, they can't because it's a shame. It's a shame that we're not perhaps we're more, more honest that they can't do these things. Yeah. Um, with the uh, thought of kind of ongoing uh, sort of lifelong learning, uh, there are some professionals that are moving into the space of data. I'm, I'm from the data science side of things, from statistics. So that kind of gap is not just assuming the GCSEs were there. I was thinking, I've done this 15 years ago. How do I quickly get myself in that, you know, in that place where I'm comfortable to then do the statistical learning on top? Yeah, it's exactly. Yeah, yeah. And and it's not. I mean, it's not particularly difficult stuff. It's just kind of if you don't know, you don't know. If you've forgotten, it's like you see an integer, you think, oh, what's an integer? And it's and it's as soon as somebody tells you and shows it to you, it's fairly well straightforward and then you've you've done it you can move on but because there's not a lot of support there in the, up here I think that's perhaps one of the reasons one of the barriers um, for why there's not more books in that area and perhaps there should be 
<laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll work on it, yeah. <laughs> I think lots of people are looking for online resources more and more and more, um, rather than yeah, textbooks, maybe a little bit, wow, it's a big thing and I have to learn everything inside this, rather than sort of looking for snippets of things online. Yeah. Sure. yeah. It's a lot more kind of like hybrid yeah. things these days. Yeah, no, I mean, I just read one, one last thing, which, which just makes me think about what, what you just said, Eleanor. Um, so, talking about resources and, and things you do online, so we get our students to do this thing, um, and, we, and we get them to, um, so we're looking at bootstrapping, so we just get them to just pick a person. And then it and it takes the and then it replaces it for them and then it, it works out the median for them and some students love doing that by hand, other students love doing it online um, and and it's, it's usually a split and you, obviously you're doing it with the person next to you with bits of paper um, and it really um, there's a bit of energy there whereas you some love just to do that with the laptops and the padlets or whatever, the pads or iPads whatever they're using um, but this is um, applications that Anna Ferguson created a few of these things and they. They're great, um, and it just makes it a bit more, a bit more engaging. Okay, well, thank you so much. That's been really, really fantastic. I've got so many more questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask you those separately, otherwise I'll be here all evening. But thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and yeah, thank you to everybody for, for coming.